So I want to ask you this afternoon, you brethren here, and all of you think about it personally, and all you brethren around the world, whether you're in the Philippines or South Africa or Perth, Australia, or wherever you are, doesn't make any difference. What is your breaking point? What is your breaking point? What will be the point or the situation that would take you, you personally, out of God's church? The church of God which is doing the work of God the church of God which is preaching the whole counsel of God more thoroughly than any other church on earth. You say, you're not perfect. No, we're not. But we are doing that. And we are doing that, and we are doing those things. And the church which is, has and is teaching and is practicing the government of God, not perfectly, but again, more than any other church. There are other churches that have hierarchical governments, but the main ones I know of and the main ones you know of have become dictatorships and the men in charge are just putting people out if they disagree and just kick them out even in some cases for visiting their own family things like that horrible stuff and as all you know we don't have that any of you who are new just look around talk to your brethren here back in Dallas or back in Chicago or Melbourne Australia wherever you may hear this we don't have that kind of atmosphere we don't have an atmosphere of fear where people are being afraid they might get kicked out for saying the wrong thing. And we never had and We're not going to have. Think, brethren, all of us are going to be tried and tested. And many of you have already been tried and tested, but it's not over. I have been tried and tested tremendously. And frankly, God would not let me be where I am now, except I've been tried and tested and tested and tried over and over and over again. I know that as I look back on my life. But I'm certainly not perfect yet. And I'm going to have to have a lot more trials and tests, I'm sure, before it's all over. People back in the 1950s sometimes got upset at Mr. Armstrong. We had a guy named Herb, not like Mr. Armstrong, but I guess his full name was Herbert. He was an English teacher and a leading uh, student, leader. And they left the church because they were concerned back at that time about the fact that Mr. Armstrong was paraphrasing some material out of a book in one of his booklets. Well, Dr. Hay and I got Herman Hay, and I was the one that organized this, and we went through it with Mr. Armstrong, and he let us remove those passages or rewrite them. Was he borrowing? A little bit. But as he said, I like a one-armed paper hanger. I had to put all this work together, and he did. I understood that. He didn't try to copy the whole booklet, but he did paraphrase a few paragraphs. And so these people got all buggy about that and some other things, and they thought that was their excuse to be more righteous than Mr. Armstrong and leave the college and leave the work, which they did. And they were going to go out and do something, they said. What did they do? I guess they fell off the edge of the earth because <laughs> I never heard from them again. I don't even know if they're alive. They certainly didn't do any work. Gone. Others in the 50s did similar things. In the 60s, we had various ministers leaving because they were upset about this or that or had various moral problems. What was the result? Nothing, except it hurt them. It took them and any of their followers out of the church. In the 1970s, we had one or two leading men leave. In 1972, when that came and went and a certain personal problem came out, then some others left in 73, and a whole wave left in 1974, we had some guys back on the East Coast, back here, in fact, and on north from here, take away about 30 ministers and 3,000, get it, 3,000 brethren. That would be almost the total number of brethren we have in the whole church here in the United States. Today, not quite, but maybe three-fourths. It's a lot of folks. That's what they did. You think, well, that would just be awful, like Mr. Armstrong had failed. Well, he didn't fail, but there was a problem and he didn't deal with the problem quite as quickly or quite as harshly as some of them wanted him to. And so they left. And they had other excuses and other reasons. Did God bless their work? No, they themselves have split. And I can name names and where they are. But they themselves have split in 10 or 15 different directions. And from what I understand, most of their followers who left have gone back to the world just in confusion. Have they got the gospel of the kingdom of God around the world? No way. Are they warning our peoples with the Ezekiel message to help them? No way. What are they doing? They just wanted to do their thing. They got their feelings hurt, some of them, and they were upset. They wanted to outrighteous Mr. Armstrong, so they left. Then we had the problem of the receivership. 
1979, and Mr. Armstrong and Stanley Rader were accused of absconding with a lot of money. And the state broke in, and then again, some ministers got all upset because they say, well, bad guys are taking over. Well, I was brought in as the director of the ministry, and I privately checked up on Mr. Rader as far as any of the uh, accusations of stealing money were concerned. I don't think I've ever told this publicly before, but I did. I had our business manager up, the one that was under him, privately to this very secret place, the Pancake House of La Cunata, the IHOP. And we, uh, Wayne and Susanna remembered some of where that place is. And we had breakfast one morning, and I went right through it. And he said, well, Stan might put everything, including shoestrings, on expense and various things, but it said no way would he steal money. He's too smart for that, and he has enough money anyway. But I wanted to be sure. I was trying to check up because I didn't want to be backing something that was wrong, and I found out that part was not wrong. I knew Mr. Armstrong was not wrong, but he was being accused of various things, and people were leaving the church, dozens of them, hundreds of them, dozens of ministers and hundreds of people, maybe two or 3,000 altogether. I don't think we ever got an accurate count. We had the war room set up in my office on the fourth floor, the northwest corner of the fourth floor of the Hall of Administration, and most all day long we had sitting there with me off and on in these meetings which were going almost continually while well, I had Burke McNair who was willing to come out and help and then we had I asked Carl McNair first but he said please Rod I have my sons here and my family and I've got my Shangri-La right up here to keep my family together so if you could get Burke so I got Burke and and Carl of course came with us to help in this work but Burke came back there and I gave him credit for that to help me hold things together and several other older ministers, and we were calling, getting calls from all over the world, accusing, 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 and so forth. We had to hold the church together. Were there mistakes being made? Yes, there were mistakes being made, but I had to back off, and then later I myself, after working my tail off, after going day and night and night and day and day and night, and my wife can testify that, I fainted twice. And I have never fainted before in my life, before or since. I was under such pressure getting calls from South Africa, from, from Australia and New Zealand, what's going on. The previous director of the ministry had an unlisted phone, and the ministers couldn't even get through to him. And I heard that, of course. I didn't do that. I just let them all call me. I maybe shouldn't have, but I knew people were hurting. So I took their calls, and I was under a great deal of stress. But right after that, my reward for practically killing myself for about seven months was being sent into exile in Hawaii. I had every excuse to get bitter. I had every excuse to turn aside. It was a tremendous opportunity to start Rod Meredith's church because a lot of people would have followed me back there. They would too. They were all upset, confused. But it would not have been God's church. It would have been Rod Meredith's church. And I knew that. And I didn't do it. I just had to wait on God to straighten it out in due time. And I prayed and I fasted until God finally did do that. And so you have to sometimes wait on God and let God take care of things. But these things have gone on through the years, many, many times. So think, brethren, all of us have been and will be tried and tested. But what's the result of all these guys leaving? What is the result of this group of fellows and that I'm trying to think of even personalities that better not mention their names some are still alive and might sue us but what did they do nothing they split up from the church most of them later split up from each other if they did go out as a group they've done no work they've done no message to the world they've done no message to the United States they haven't helped anybody they've simply taken themselves out of the church of God and showed that they were not willing and humble enough to trust Christ to straighten it out in his time and to do his work and to run his church. I'm not implying Mr. Armstrong did a lot of bad things. He did not. But he was an older man up in his 80s, and people were taking advantage of him, and when he found out, he tried to straighten it out, and he didn't always straighten it out quite as quickly or forcefully as some like. So they tried to grab the reins and kick him out and throw him out, and got the state to come in, as a matter of fact, and try to do it. It was a terrible thing, a terrible time. Very trying and testing. 
Back in 1 Peter, if you turn there with me at this point, turn to your New Testament here. 1 Peter. And I'm going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 and beginning in verse 17. God tells us through Peter, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved. Now, a lot of brethren, and some of you without realizing it, some of you brethren in the world, out there in other churches, may think, well, I'm really fine and I have a lot of margin of error. No, you don't have a lot of margin of error. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we only are going to get into God's kingdom through grace, through God's mercy, because of the death of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So let's not take it for granted that we're so righteous, we have no problem. We do not. I do not. You do not. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Do the very best you can serving a faithful creator. He says a little later here in chapter 5, telling the elders to try to serve the brethren. And in verse 5, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Brethren, that's hard to do. Most of us want to strut around and feel important. And I notice whenever we've had anyone come into the church, again, I better not mention names, but we had a very important businessman come with us several years ago out in San Diego who'd been rather high up in business, and he had a way of walking like this, and he'd walk in and so on. Very obvious, you know, he had this, this way, this manner. He was in charge, you know, and just the way he walked, you thought he was showing he was the big one. Well... He kind of left in rebellion, and he's kind of disappeared, and he sent me greetings through others at times, so I hope he'll come back so I better shut up. A nice man, but he had this something by being in the business world. That's what they do. They want to make their presence known. One guy that left Mr. Armstrong uh, years ago used to always make his presence known, and I noticed that. I thought, well, he's got an awful lot of vanity, but maybe he's sincere, and we hope the best. But he would always have these certain ways of acting very important. And when he would poke his head and come in late or something into the faculty dining room, well, he would open it and then he would kind of do like this and make and then wait and, and to make sure he gets noticed. And then he would come on in. And just a certain way that he had to be very important. He had to be noticed, had to be noticed, be the big shot every time. Some people are like that. That doesn't prove they're evil, but it's just a tendency. Every one of us wants to be important. I want to be important. You want to be important. Men like to be important in the sense of having more money or a higher job or position or power or whatever, be big and strong when they're young. Women like to be important in having a certain position, a situation, socially, be way up or be more pretty and get noticed that way or whatever. Each of us has this desire. But God says, be clothed, be clothed, just covered with humility. Ooh, that's hard. <laughs> you know that. Be honest. How can you be clothed with humility all day? Well, the only way you can is through having Christ in you, and you've got to keep growing in that the rest of your life. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And brethren, we need to realize that. God is not playing games. He inspired Peter to put it that way. Satan is really like a roaring lion. And I've never been out in the African jungle in that particular way. I've been in Africa, but not out in some wild animal park all alone facing a lion. 
But I saw this uh, movie years ago, and I never can remember the name just right, but it was The Night in the Darkness or something like that about these two big lions. Some of you saw that they're building this railway, and uh, these lions kill people. It's based on a very real story. And that made the idea of lions more real to me because it really happened. And then it was impressed on my mind again because just a year or so after we saw that movie, my wife and I, went with the local minister to the uh, Field Museum uh, in Chicago, a natural history museum, and they had those exact lions there. They finally got a whole bunch of trackers in there and killed those very lions and stuffed them, and there they are. And they were big lions, and it was just unusual thinking of them coming at you. And the reason they killed so many men is that most men were thinking lions usually hunt together. These lions hunted as a pair. And the man would turn one way, and then the lion from the other side would come and get him before he could whip around and get his gun on him. And they killed man after man after man when they were building these railways there. It's a terrible thing. But to hear them roar and hear the man scream, and then the lion would often get and just tear his guts right out and so on, and it didn't describe that in great detail in the movie, but you could hear that, see that in a certain sense and understand what was happening. Satan is going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he will try to devour you and he will try to devour me. You say, well, you're the human leader. How could he devour you? You think you're above that. No, I'm not. He'll get at me in all kinds of different ways. And I know that. I need not describe all those ways. But I have my human nature to it, and he will come after me in many different ways. So all of us need to pray for one another. Resist him. That's a command from God. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions or sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory, and notice the Greek here is into, ice he called us into not just to the foot of the mountain but into his eternal glory as the greek is or to have that very glory by christ jesus after when after you just got a float into the kingdom merrily 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 floating down the stream no we don't float into god's kingdom we have to overcome we have to pray we have to shed tears. We have to cry out to God, help me, like Jesus did. And so after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Yes, God will do that for us, but we have our part to do, and we are not going to drift into God's kingdom. It will not be easy. And so we have to understand the enemy we have. And how he will try to drag us out of the church of God, just like those lions not only caught men out in the bush, but it showed a couple times they literally came right in their dormitories at night or in the one tent of this special hunter that they would sent out, this top lion hunter, but he was all alone. And he didn't realize they'd come after him at night, and somehow they were very, it said, intelligent, unusual lions. They came in and dragged him right out in the bush, and they found his carcass and blood all over out there later. They got him too. They will drag you right out of your tent. They will drag you right out of your house. Satan will drag you right out of God's church if he can, like a lion. So we have to understand that and understand that that analogy is very real. Jeremiah 17 tells us, us part of the problem and what we need to understand. Jeremiah chapter 17 and beginning in verse 7 Blessed is the man who trusts in the ever-living one. If you really trust in God, trust in God and know that he's alive and that Christ is alive and he's the living head of his church and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out at root, its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart See, the heart of man, the heart is deceitful above all things. The natural attitude and reasonings of, of man, what can I do to be a, get ahead? What can I do to be more important? What games can I play? It's deceitful above all things. 
God says in the Proverbs, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. I can't trust in my own heart, and you can't trust in your heart. You'll have ideas that come, and then you have to realize, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. That is not right. This is my feeling. I want to justify myself. I want to think I'm right all the time, and no, I'm not right all the time, and you're not right all the time. The only one who's right all the time is God, and that's because he is spirit. He's not human. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the eternal, search the heart. I test. Get this, brethren. I test the mind. God tests us. And you read in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3, and Proverbs, uh, or Psalm 7, verse 9, and Psalm 105, verse 19, the same thing. Many other places where God tests. I won't read all the scriptures and just take time reading them redundantly. But he says over and over that he tests us. He's testing and testing and testing you and me. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, not just according to what we think about ourselves, but according to what we really do, you see, and according to the fruit of his doings. So God will be testing us. Brethren, God tried to put one great being over the earth, tremendous capacity, absolute gorgeous human being, or being, I should say, tremendous beauty and high intelligence, fantastic musical skills, everything else, his name was Lucifer, shining star of the dawn. But he began to have this vanity. And I'm just as good as you are, that same attitude. I'm just as good as you are. I'll be like God. I will go up and take over and kick God out. This was the attitude. Now, are you just as good as Mr. Armstrong as a human being? Yes. Was I just as good as Mr. Armstrong as a human being? Yes, we're all human. But God appointed that man, and by the fruits... I could see that, that he had great miracles and lightning and thunder coming down from the top of Mount Sinai to show that he was God's apostle. No, he didn't. But the fruits over decades showed that God had done a mighty work through him, and he had raised up a whole era of the church of God, and he did have unusual miracles also happen, and on many other signs that God was working through him in a unique manner. And so most of us recognize that he was an apostle. Some of you sitting here, some of you brethren out there may not believe that. And you don't have to believe that. That's not a doctrine of salvation. You can just acknowledge he was a wonderful minister. But I believe he was an apostle. He's always said, I wasn't an apostle in the same exact sense and stature of Peter and Paul. No, he didn't get to see Christ personally. But God used him in a powerful way, an unusual way. So we didn't have that office. I didn't have that office. Mr. Armstrong, later a guy followed him, and he, when he always tried to correct me, he would set, have a whole Supreme Court sitting there. He'd have eight or ten, literally, sometimes twelve other men sitting in there because I think he was afraid to talk to me alone. I don't think he thought I'd beat him up. <laughs> but he had been my student, and I brought him out, and he knew I knew his problems. He always had someone else for moral support. Anyway... That's the way it is. So we all have to forgive one another and be humble enough to let God work with us through imperfect human beings. Sometimes they're our parents. Sometimes they're our boss. Sometimes they might even be the leader in the church. Not perfect in any case. Only God is perfect. So you have these trials and tests. And you have this human nature. What to do? How can you stay in God's church then? and not let this breaking point hit you where you leave. Here's some basic principles that you need to use, brethren, and I hope you'll try to get it down, because these things are happening, and it can happen to you. Don't think it can't. As I've said before, and I'll say again, I'm not trying to be, you know, mean about it, but I can bring out the old envoys and show you the picture of the vice president's big, glorious, beautiful 1969 envoy college yearbook. And there said all these big shots there. I was among them. But all but three or four left the church or had to be kicked out. The top men in the work of God, evangelists and vice presidents of the work of God, they either had to be kicked out or left. What's wrong? Human nature under the influence of Satan the devil. And I have seen these men, I knew these men, 
Sometimes I tell my wife, this guy says this or that, and I can see he's not really converted, but maybe he is. I don't know, you know, Margie, and I, I don't understand, but it looks like this guy's really carnal, and I don't understand it. Here he's in that office, but I guess we better not judge him, or she'd say, well, don't judge him. Later on, sure enough, he left. Later on, sure enough, he had to be kicked out. Later on, maybe he joined the rebellion and tried to overthrow Mr. Armstrong, whatever it was. Big guys. Most of those men were bigger, handsomer, more impressive than I am. They were, too. I named them. I know some of our older people here know who I'm talking about. They were busier, bigger physically, more impressive looking. Some of them had better minds. Some of them had equal minds, but... They were bigger and more impressive. Some of them had better minds than I do, and I'm well aware of that. Some of them had magnificent personalities. But God calls the weak of the world, so he had to reach way down to call me, and I'm well aware of that. That can help you to be more humble if you have more to be humble about, <laughs> I guess. We hope so. I remember the story of Winston Churchill. He had been kicked out, you know, of being prime minister, and Clement Attlee came in with the Labor Party, and uh, his, someone was saying, well, Mr. Attlee's very humble, and uh, Churchill said, yes, but he has much to be humble about. And then, of course, you know, number 10 Downing Street was where the prime minister lived, and then Churchill said another time, he said, an empty taxi cab, empty taxi cab pulled up at number 10 Downing Street, and Clement Attlee got out. <laughs> anyway, he thought there's nothing there. And of course, Attlee didn't begin to have the capacity that Churchill had, but Churchill had a lot of ego to go along with his capacity. No one ever accused Winston of being unduly humble. He, he was smart and he knew it, and sometimes these big guys have that, and that's a problem. Well, here's some of the things to do. Go back, brethren, in your mind... And I've had to do that when I've been all alone and in trouble. Sometimes when you get down or something's happening, you're all alone. When I was sent out in exile in Hawaii, who did I have? In a sense, I had no one. I said my young wife, newly married from Little Widow from Bakersfield, and I had my eight, nine or ten-year-old daughter, Rebecca, and then Jim and Mike stayed a little bit, then went back home. But in a sense, I was all alone out there. I was not allowed to attend church. The one who had saved the church, humanly speaking, helped hold it together more than anyone else at that point in time, except Mr. Armstrong himself, of course, and his letters, but calling the ministers, having th meetings, meeting after meeting, and call after call, and visit after visit. Why, I had to fight my attitude and just ask God to take care of it. But you have to think those things through. I had to go back over. The basics are these. God. Is there a real God, a spirit personality who created the earth and is alive and has his son Jesus Christ alive at his right hand? Is this book, the Bible, really inspired of God? You think that's very basic? Yes, but you'd better go back and prove all that or you will leave eventually if you're not sure of some of those things, any one of those things. Then you need to prove the true church of God. Where is the real church of God that God is using to do his work? And go back over the basic things, and I'll give you a few things later, but prove that and why it is. Now, brethren, if you haven't proved those things, really proved them, then you'll probably leave someday. How dare I say that? Because tens of thousands of people never proved those things the way they should have, and they're gone. That's why I say that. You know all these brethren by the tens of thousands back in worldwide. A lot of them just went back to the world. Some of them dropped out of every church. Some of them went back to the Calvary Baptist Church or this church or that church in the world. Some of my former students have gone to places like that. Blew my mind to realize that. They never really proved the basic things about God and the Bible and the church. Thousands of worldwide people have never done that or never did do that. And the result utter confusion and mass apostasy, total departure from the truth. Then after you've done that, always try to see when something comes up and you're tempted to get your feelings hurt, you're tempted to justify yourself and put down the leadership, you're tempted to leave for any reason at all, always back off and try to see the big picture. 
And I can never emphasize that enough. Most people are small-minded by nature, and they get down to some personal issue. Their feelings were hurt. They don't like to admit it that way, but that's what it usually comes down to. Their feelings were hurt. Some have a doctrinal issue, but often feelings enter into that too. Not really a big doctrinal issue in most cases. Others, of course, are just weak. And there are those people, they're the minority, but some are just weak and fall away because they get taken over by the devil and they get off into drinking and, and drugs and, and sex, illicit sex, and just drop out of the church. So you need to back off and see the big picture. I can't give you all the big picture today, but we're doing that all the way through in all of our sermons. But here's a few things to think about in that relationship. Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, put everything on it. And then in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, the Father and the Word who emptied himself and became Jesus said, those two personalities, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. So from the beginning, man was to have dominion and be given authority over the earth and so forth. We were to be made and were made like God because ultimately, as you all know, we were to be full sons of God. That's why we're made. So that's part of God's very plan from the beginning and a very important thing to think about. Then you turn back to Genesis, I mean to John, excuse me, not Genesis, but this time to the Gospel of John, if you would turn there. John and... Uh, Catch my marker here, verse 17, or chapter 17, John 17, verse 20. This is Jesus' last prayer to God. And he had said in verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me together with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Here's the one who said, Let there be light, and there was light. Here's that great spokesman, the Logos, now a human being. He said, give me back that tremendous glory I had with you from eternity, Father. That's what he prayed for. That awesome glory, the full glory of God. And so he said a little later, after praying for his disciples, he said in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. We believe through the word of God. That's why we're here. We didn't get to talk to Christ personally. We didn't get to talk to Peter and James and John personally. We wish we could. I'd love to do that, but we do it through the Word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. That same supreme glory to be very God, that they may be one just as we are one. One family, one level of existence, one God, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent them me and have loved them as you have loved me. Not in some different way, but as you have loved them as you have loved me. Make us full sons of God, full members of the family of God. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, what you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. You see, Jesus had a family spirit. These were to be part of his family. These people were to be, and us were to be his brothers. We were to be like him, with him in a family environment. And so each of us are to become full sons of God, full members of the family of God and share a family, the same level of existence, the sharing. I want these people to be with me. I want to share with them. And God wants to share all eternity with us, to work together, to strive together, to plan together, to accomplish together throughout the whole universe, no doubt, later on. That's what a family is all about, and that's what we're going to be doing along with God and Christ, and we'll get to know Abraham and Isaac and Israel as personalities and talk to them. And the glorious personality, King David, and the other great men and women of the Old Testament, Sarah, Ruth, all those women who serve God down through time. And we'll get to know the other leaders in the New Testament as well and see how they walk with God and talk to them, interact with them 
and have that opportunity, we will be members of a family. So God wants a close, loyal family. He does not want a bunch of Lucifers running around saying, I'm going to beat you out, I'm going to take over. He wants that kind of attitude in his family. So we can become full sons of God, and then the church collectively, all of us become what? We become the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. And Christ must be able to trust his bride. What if you men could not trust your wife? And you're wondering if they're off with another man, or they're stealing from you, or they're doing this or that. What a horrible thing that would be. Christ is not going to allow that in his family. No way. Turn to Ephesians. Ephesians, we'll start with chapter 1. I'll get the other part later. He talks here in Ephesians 1, verse 19, about the great working of God's mighty power. Verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. And he, God, put all things under his, Christ's feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So the church is the body of Christ. The church is the physical instrument that Christ, God uses and Christ uses to do his work today. And together we can, we're like, in a, in a sense, an analogy, the very bride of Christ. We're his, we're his wife. We serve him. We help him. We share with him totally as a wife shares her husband's life, as a wife shares her husband's successes and so forth in the same way. Turn back to Ephesians 5 now. It tells us in verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So the church is to be totally subject to Christ. Christ cannot have a church that's off running around here and there like a, you know, a rebellious wife, a lustful wife, a disloyal wife. He's not going to have that. And so we're in that place. He is trying you and testing me, brethren, you brethren here and you ministers here, you ministers hearing this here and all over the world, think about this because we've had ministers leaving too, no question about it, as you know, even recently. Are you just ready to leave at the drop of a hat? What is Christ going to think of you if you have that attitude? He's going to know that when the going gets rough out on Alpha Centauri or whatever planet you have, well, I'll just go do my own thing because you've proved that before. You see what I mean? He cannot trust you to be a leading member of his kingdom. And if you don't repent of what you do now, he won't even let you in his kingdom to be there in the first place if you do not eventually show him a depth of loyalty, a depth of stability, a depth of, uh, of obedience to know that he can trust you. Christ is not in the business of inventing more Lucifers. He's not, and he won't do it. He just won't do it, and we have to understand that. So you've got to go back and prove basic things here. So each of us needs to prove, again, where God's church really is. And be sure, then, that once we prove that, if you have to go back and reprove it again from time to time, do that. But be sure. Be objective. Don't let your feelings get in the way. Here are three major signs of God's true church. I've given them you many times, but write them down if you haven't. You need this. This is terribly important. Three major identifying signs of the church of God, the true church. First of all, the true church of God, wherein God, Christ is working and so on, is the church that teaches the full truth of God. Not perfectly, because no church has ever taught it. No human organization has ever done anything perfectly, and no human being has done. But overall, is teaching the full truth of God. And I could go down the line with each one of these other churches that you know about, and like these guys, that one guy calls himself an apostle. Why? Because he had great signs from God or miracles? No. 
He just decided to appoint himself an apostle. <laughs> that ought to be a big sign right there. But most people can't figure that out. Another guy calls himself, you know, a great prophet of God. And he was one who has twisted and twisted and twisted and perverted literally dozens of scriptures. I read his stuff when I was first thinking about what to do before I started Global and got his basic booklet and some of his articles and listened to him. And I saw all this twisting and I thought, no, this guy doesn't understand the Bible. He left us. He left Mr. Armstrong and he left what Mr. Armstrong had done at least and the truth and the work at a time where it wasn't necessary to do that yet. Things were still in a state of flux and then he began to twist a whole lot of scriptures and pervert them and misapply them. It was very obvious to me. I'd been one of his former Bible teachers. I could see that. Not difficult, but it wouldn't be as easy perhaps for some of you, but it was very obvious. This, and then now they have these ideas of just kicking people out for any reason. They're afraid. They're paranoid. That's why they're doing that, because they understand or sense that they really don't have solid truth and solid proof, so they have to overreact by kicking people out just for asking questions. That's ridiculous. You ask all the questions you want to the ministers who are here, and I hope you will if you have questions, and we can answer your questions in every case, and if we can't, we'll go find the answer in the Bible, not our opinion. But anyway, this is the church that teaches more of the full truth of God than any other. Secondly, the true church does the work of God, again, more perfectly. There are other churches that have a sort of a work, but one of these guys I've just referred to, he t teaches a lot about prophecy, but he misapplies prophecy a lot, several things. He keeps saying Iran is the king of the south, which it is not. Iran is northeast of Palestine, of Jerusalem, not south, and will not be the king of the south. And all, but all kinds of other mistakes he makes, but he does some, some things that are correct. Well, the Protestants do some things that are correct. Human nature is a mixture of good and evil. God gave Adam and Eve the choice of taking the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Please understand that, brethren. Just because a church has some good doesn't mean that that is the true church of God. But you'd better find the church that has overwhelming the truth all the way through. Then there are other churches that are less dictatorial, but they have big gaps in their understanding of various aspects of the Bible. Some of the main ones, they don't believe in church eras. And they have different ideas about born again. And they don't believe in church government and all kinds of other even basic doctrinal errors that they have in their understanding. And they'll twist the Bible to help prove that. And I can show that. I've seen them in their writings. They've twisted, perverted things that are obviously a certain way. And they may come out another way to try to prove their idea. If they'd been in my freshman Bible again, which most of their leaders had been, I would... I would say, George, and get off of it. The Bible doesn't say that. But they're not in my class anymore, so I can't do that. But at any rate, it does the work of God. What is the work of God? The work of God is preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God based on God's law to all the nations. And we're supposed to do that. And that's what we're trying to do with all of our heart not just attacking other churches and saying they're all laid in sin and we're the only true church. We're getting that message out far more in a positive way, not attacking others, but in a positive way, as you know, through the telecast, through our magazine, through our internet, than any other church. We have so many more responses than these other churches, there's no real comparison. When you look at it, the number of calls we get in, over 4,000 a week recently from the telecast. One other church publishes their statistics, but I want one point. Recently, I was showing, figuring how we had 26 times as many responses, and uh, the, the others don't even begin to have that because they don't have a commercial television program in the first place, some of them, and they don't have the impact that we have. So we're doing that far more than any other, the work of God. So the work is to preach the gospel of the kingdom or to preach the end-time prophecies, what some of these other churches, even apart from the new, dic new uh, dictators, one of them at least does not do at all. They're, one of their men said, well, prophecy is the bad news, and so we're just going to preach the good news. So they don't even talk about prophecy. And then we're to give the Ezekiel warning to our Israelite people. You know, Ezekiel 33, to warn our peoples. The great tribulation is about to happen. Wake up while you have the opportunity. 
What other church on earth is doing that? Frankly, there isn't any other. We're the only ones doing that. And then, of course, the other aspect of the church is to feed the flock and to help people grow under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, some of these other churches teach a certain degree of Christian living, but again, much is watered down. And one of the main aspects, not the only main aspect, but a, an important aspect of Christian living is to teach all of God's people all the time the correct form of government. Which brings us into point three. The third identifying sign is the true church teaches and practices the correct form of the government of God. And we used to kind of de-emphasize that, and people says, oh, you're talking about government. But brethren, Mr. Armstrong sometimes said, that's the whole thing. Government is the whole thing. Well, he said that in a certain sense, and in one sense it is. What are we preaching? Government. The kingdom of God. The word kingdom means government. And if we don't teach the right approach to government, and these other churches don't teach it, and their people are not learning that, learning that, practicing that, getting their minds on that, how can they possibly be taught as part of the truth, you see, and as part of the church practice as well, you know, the right form of government that they're supposed to teach and to administer in a very few years when Christ comes back? Well, the answer is they can't. They're not learning it, and they're not practicing it. If you're going to be a king or a priest within the next, whatever it is, 10 to 20 years, let's say, in round numbers, that's all I'm talking about, round numbers, it might be 25 or 30, but I think it's closer to maybe 12 to 15 when Christ will be on this earth after three years of tribulation, three and a half, then how can you suddenly be a king or priest and your church has not talked about that. Your church has talked about voting, and we'll decide this by committee, and we'll vote on this and vote on that, and that's the whole approach you've had all your life in this church. Is that right? No. That's a very important thing. People who can't trust Christ to lead his church through his form of government have a deep, profound lack of faith in the Christ of the Bible. They don't like to think of it that way, but that is what it amounts to, if you follow me. They do not trust Christ to lead his church through his form of government that is the only form of government found in all the Bible. There isn't any other there. So these are the three identifying signs. The true church teaches the full truth, and not perfectly. We grow in grace and knowledge. It does the work of God, and certainly we're trying to do it ever more perfectly and powerfully. And the true church teaches and practices the government, the correct form of the government of God. Again, we grow in understanding and how to do that as we overcome and learn and have more of God's spirit. We don't do any of that perfectly, but we're doing those three things more than any other church. If you see those things and you realize why we're here, why are you called now? As Mr. Armstrong used to say, you're not called now just to have personal salvation you're called so you can help do the work of God today. And secondly, prepare to be a king or priest in a very few years when Christ comes back. Why doesn't the church help its people to prepare for that other reason you're called now rather than in the great white throne judgment? They don't understand. They're not being used by God to prepare the kings and priests in the same way. So the church that Christ is using primarily... Other churches have bits and pieces of some of these things, of course. But to carry on these three things, to show these three signs, that is where Christ is primarily working. And that's where you ought to be, and that's where I ought to be. And if I die on the way home tonight, I preach too hard and have a heart attack. And I'm kidding, but, you know, it could happen, of course. That's where I want my wife to be. Therefore, that's where I want Elizabeth and, and Mike and Jim and Becca and David and Jonathan and my grandchildren to be. That's what I want. That's where God's church is. And faithful men here, such as Mr. Ames and, you know, others, Dr. Winnale and others, would carry on. And this work would grow and this work could continue. We have a whole council of elders, of faithful men, and they would carry on along that same line without naming all of them. Finally, brethren, only one church has all these signs, and I think you recognize that if you really think it through and try to prove it to yourself. 
So what could make you leave the true church which is doing the work? What? Over 54 years now in Christ's ministry in my life, I have had the opportunity to observe men and women, mainly men, of course, and often their wives would follow them, leave God's church, ministers and teachers and administrators back in the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s. And I'm really tempted to name names. Mr. Ames and, and uh, others have been with me. They know I have to blight it off so I have to cut it out of the tape. They're right on the tip of my tongue. I'm not trying to cover up anything. I just don't want to be hurting people that might still be alive or start a lawsuit. But I know what I'm talking about. I dealt with these guys and saw this going on personally, probably more than any other human being that's still alive. I'm not bragging. That's just the way it is. That's a fact. No one else is alive that worked with those men the way I have as their Bible teacher, their boss, whatever, for a while, most of them or many of them, and got to know them and got right in the big middle of those things over those years. But here are some of the big reasons they left. People would get hurt feelings, and they would get their mind on themselves. Here's a big reason, the biggest single reason people would leave. They would get hurt feelings and get their mind on the self. I remember one big shot guy that was hurt by Mr. Armstrong uh, correcting him, and at one point he talked about Armstrong extravagance and that might have been a reason, but he had his mind on himself a lot. And I've given you this example before, but he was way up there, had a big salary, big 4,000 square foot home and swimming pool, everything. And so he was put down from the corner office. The corner office are usually the most prestigious ones in a big building. You know, you had windows on both sides. On the fourth floor to a corner office on the third floor, his salary stayed the same, one of the biggest salaries in the church. I was second vice president, so I knew that. He still had a big opportunity, still had his big house. No one assaulted his wife or his children. He had his family, everything. He just had a slightly smaller office, slightly smaller job. He said, I can't take this. I can't take this. Really upset. I said, George, I said, you're still living in your house. Your wife still loves you. His name was not George. You know, I just used George as a whatever. <laughs> and, well, you know, but he was all mad. His vanity was hurt. His balloon had been pricked because he'd been exalting himself, and Mr. Armstrong and others had lowered his profile for a while. I can't take this. There was a guy overseas that would had a big job and was striding around and acting extremely important for years, and I sensed that and knew that very well. <laughs> And his balloon was pricked after a while where he was given a less, lesser job and the area he was over had the budget removed. He said, okay, Tiger, lower, lower my budget and go, go after him, Tiger. And he began to kind of talk loud like that in a kind of a sarcastic way. And I could tell his attitude turned. He began to get bitter. And instead of thinking Mr. Armstrong was the 10 feet tall, which he used to do, and like Mr. Armstrong was God, suddenly he began to talk against Mr. Armstrong, subtly at first and then more later, and led a rebellion of hundreds of people, a rebellion against Mr. Armstrong and the work. When the work was still being done, the truth was being taught because his area was cut back for a while. And again, he couldn't take that. And so that's what happens. Hurt feelings over a lowered sense of importance or job and so on. And then various ministers and people in the church often want to be very important. They want to be a deacon or a super deacon to boss everybody around. Or they want to be an elder or a super elder and boss everyone around in a certain way. And if you prick their balloon, they get all bent out of shape. They'll just leave the church sometimes, and again, that's happened. I think I told, talked to you about the coffee wars we had back in one church in the Midwest or Mid-South, and I, some were responding. I forget which place, oh no, one or two places, but anyway, I won't try to remember exactly. But these women got all upset because one woman, 
I mean, they, the women needed a better coffee pot, and they were going to take up a collection just between them and the next Sabbath bring money or do something and get it. Then the one woman beat it to it, paid for the whole thing, and the others got really mad at her and would even speak to her, and it became the coffee wars. Why? Well, they all wanted to be important. I want to do this, I, you know, whatever. Why? Vanity, selfishness, lust, and greed. The self gets hurt. Would you leave the church of God over a coffee pot? Some would. Some would, brethren. Don't kid yourself. Human nature is awful. <laughs> it is silly. It is just silly. But people do that kind of thing, and you have to really, really understand it. Now, I don't think anyone leave, did leave over the coffee pot, did they? Uh, Maria, do you remember? I don't know. Anyway, but it was a upset for a while. Anyway, people want to be important. And if their balloon is pricked, I remember we used to have one guy way back when that was acting very important, and, and he had a, a big, very important uh, attitude about himself. And he had to take a lesser job. And uh, then when he was in a lesser job, we had reports from all of the uh, division heads in the work at one time, and they would all talk. We would all running bigger multi-million dollar divisions, and his division was about one-fourth or sixth as large, but he ended up having the biggest talk of all, and then he acted like he knew everything about everything. And I asked, look, this one man was technical-minded. I wasn't, but this guy knew everything about automobiles and refrigerators and television and just everything, and he really cocky, and I looked over at in this case, Norman Smith, who was really smart and brilliant in those areas. Uh, and Norman knew what I meant. I went at Norman, and Norman said, no. <laughs> he was just bragging and bragging. Well, he eventually found an excuse to leave because I knew he wanted to be important, and his job had been cut back such because of his own vanity primarily, and he didn't understand that. So then he left. In the 1974 ministerial conference, we made the change about divorce and remarriage where people had to be go back to their original mate. If they'd been married three times, they had to go back if their third mate put them away and, uh, or something, and then they would, if to be married again, they had to go back and have the ministers try to figure out was their second marriage and find out where they lived and what happened, and then go back to the first marriage. What a mess. We couldn't do that. And finally, we realized that it's a whole different approach that Christ has. Those past mistakes before conversion can be forgiven like any other sin. And so we don't have that anymore. And boy, that was a relief to me because I had to administer that. I did not invent that doctrine, brethren. That was in when I came. But as the director of the ministry for 12 years, I had to administer that more than any other human being. And I cried sometimes having to tell people that they were separated or had to be separated. It was an awful thing, and so on. But we changed that, and we changed Pentecost, decided that the Greek or the Hebrew uh, counting from, Mr. Armstrong said, uh, one foot from this desk is not starting in the middle of the desk, and then here it's from means one foot from. And he had that fixed in his mind because he looked up all these English translations and commentaries. But finally, he got Dr. Mazar's own daughter, whom he trusted, who was a Hebrew teacher in Israel and was not even a Christian, so it was objective. She wasn't trying to argue one Christian point of view. He says, what does this mean? And then she told him the word Hebrew word can mean, which some said it did, beginning with. So if you begin with uh, 50 days and you count out of, you see, counting from the edge of the desk, 50 means 50, so then the 50th day would fall on, uh, on Sunday, not on Monday. But at any rate, we straightened that out. And so this guy had been wanting to do his own thing for years. I knew that. Many of us did. So this gave him the excuse, in my mind. So he left, and he started his own church, took several ministers, a few hundred members, not thousands, but there were two or three hundred members, and took them away and out of the church. Now, most of you don't know, and I don't care if you do know. It went way, way back, fellow, you don't know. But this happened. And what happens when people rebel against God's real church where their leader is not perfect? Mr. Armstrong was not perfect, and nothing was perfect. I was not perfect. I was involved and in others. But he didn't read, leave because of our, just a doctrinal change. Did God bless any of those works? No. It always ends up in confusion and division. 
and God is not the author of confusion. So he went off, and he had his little work for a while. Then one elder left him, whose late, later wife came with us and had been his secretary and told us the terrible situation and the vanity and so on. And so on. And then others left, other ministers left. I'm tempted to name their names. And about four or five different splits came off. And finally he got madder and madder and ended up a very sad man, a disgruntled, bitter man, because God hadn't ever blessed his work. Why? Because he rebelled against God's apostle while God's apostle was alive and while the work was being done. That's the whole thing, brethren. And that should not be. That simply should not be. And so I, I've seen that happen. Other ministers and other brethren become self-righteous. That's another thing. And they try to outrighteous Mr. Armstrong. Or they will outrighteous me or outrighteous Mr. Ames or Dr. Winnale or whichever leader they're trying to outrighteous. And so they will come up, well, we're better than you on this and that or something. And again, in every case, and I want to say this sincerely, I shouldn't say in every case, but in nearly every case that I'm known about, it involves something about power, it involves something sometimes about doctrine, but nearly always, if you know the people, you can see the self, the self-will, the hurt feelings enter into it. They are often a motivating, a huge motivating factor. Then others have a completely different problem, and they don't have it, that is, the self is not trying to fight others or exalt the self. They just get weak. These are some of the main things that have overcome people. Usually it's a combination of two or three of these things that take people out. But the doctrinal points I have found usually come out later and are an excuse uh, for this hurt feelings that people have who wanted to be important and didn't get the job or whatever they wanted. We had a recent case where that was the case. One guy left us and started his work. And suddenly he came out with these doctrines that we were wrong on. And as Mr. Ames said, he was with us eight years, eight years in the council, never brought out these problems about, about doctrine, and suddenly he has them now. Interesting. But anyway, human nature is always there. To protect yourself, brethren, always again go back through the proofs of God's true church. Where is the church really being operated that Christ is using to do his work. So that's an important thing. Always go back and think through the proofs of God's true church. Secondly, review the big picture as you're trying to hang on and where Christ is really working. Think about where Christ is really working regardless of your hurt feelings, regardless of your desire to be important. I had to do that when I was in exile in Hawaii and other times like that. Another time I was sent to England to get me away from somebody because I knew too much. And I had to think, well, I've just got to be over here and wait on Christ and it'll work out. And I like England. I helped start the church there early on and get it going a little bit under Mr. Armstrong, of course. And uh, even before Mr. McNair and Mr. Waterhouse and others ever came over, so I loved the people. I knew I was just being sent away. I just had to wait on God, and eventually God take, took care of it. But you sure can get hurt feelings if those things happen to you. But there are these desire to have your feelings hurt. People have the desire to do their own thing. We just don't want to be under any government. We don't want to be under any authority. That was the attitude of some of these people that have started some of these other groups. They don't want anyone telling them what to do. I talked to one leading man who helped found one of the major groups, and he called me and said, well, Rod, we're going to start this or that. And I said, yeah, but why don't you come with us? We're doing the work. He says, well, I know that. He said, we're preaching the truth. Do you have any objection? No, it's just that we feel we can't, you know, we can't trust one-man government anymore. Oh, really? What do you mean, one-man government? I mean, you can't trust Christ to have a leader and then a council of elders and other leading ministers like Peter did, Paul did, and in their work, Mr. Armstrong did. You can't trust that anymore, but that's what happened. So they went on, and it's a matter of that desire to do your own thing. A lot of times people say, we just like peace. We just like to do our own thing. 
Well, brethren, I know that would be nice. Each of us could do our own thing. But if you and I all did our own thing, how would the work of God get done? And if we all got our feelings hurt, went off here or there, how would there be a large growing work to go on more stations, to go on the Word Network, to go on WGN, to go on Vision up in Canada, to get more power on the Internet, to reach all over the world and have an impact on this whole world, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, the government of God, when we're not even willing to work together in a government of God today, if you follow me. Christ is watching who is he going to use in his government? Those who are unwilling to trust him to govern his church today. Those who are unwilling to work together. Those who are unwilling to trust him to straighten out problems and get their feelings hurt. Think about it. Christ is alive and he is testing. He is watching each of us along the way. You say, well, you haven't learned all your lessons yet, Meredith. And you are absolutely right. You are right. I have not learned all my lessons yet, and God will continue to work with me, smash me, teach me, guide me, humble me when necessary. But your job, if I may say so as your pastor, your job is to get your minds on your problems and to work on your problems and your salvation. That's your main responsibility, and let Christ judge me, and if I and Mr. Ames and, and Dr. Winnell and Mr. Apartheid and Mr. Crockett and others start off on some different doctrine and teach false teachings or try to wreck the work, then you could get upset. But as long as we do the work and are teaching mainly the right doctrines, not perfectly, but more than anywhere else, then you'd better say, oh, Christ hasn't got these guys perfect yet, but we're all a work in progress. <laughs> we're a work in progress. And he'll continue to work with us. And you need to have that attitude. So that's another key thing you have to, to, to work on. Don't let these hurt feelings or your desire to do your own thing or the desire to be important overwhelm the depth of humility that you must have to be in God's kingdom. That's so important. If you get the other attitude of self-will, you know, then you'll be like Saul. And I think you all know the example I've given many times, but let's turn to that back in 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, after Saul had refused to kill all these Amalekites. Boy, the trouble he would have saved us over in Iraq and the Gaza and area where he is right now, frankly, if that had been done and elsewhere. And then the animals, he kept the best of them against God's instruction. And, God, and Samuel corrected him. And then he tried to excuse himself. And when Saul excused himself, then Samuel said, verse 22, Has the eternal his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Get this, for rebellion... See, rebellion against a true authority of God, imperfect as it may be, if that office is still there and the man's still in that office, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. It's a form of idolatry. You put what you want, your desire to please the people, your desire to be important, your desire to give in to your own feelings or whatever it is ahead of God. Because you have rejected the word of God, he has also rejected you from being king. And when you want to paraphrase this a different way, you can also say he may reject you from ever being a king, you see, in his kingdom. Unless you learn, of course, and we're here to learn. We'll make some mistakes along those lines along the way. I have, you have. But we have to repent and we have to learn the lessons that God wants us to learn those lessons. Another key thing, brethren, that you need to do in this terrible situation when you're being tried and tested in that way is to cry out, please learn this and please, brethren, do this. I had to do it again and again. Cry out to God for the genuine fear of God and the true humility that you need to have in these situations. Back in Proverbs chapter 9 uh, it's a key scripture here, and, and uh, I, I better not read too many more scriptures uh, here, but I better read a couple more. Proverbs chapter 9 
And it says here in verse 10, the fear of the eternal is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. If you have that awe of God, that can help you so much not to let your mind get all bent out of shape. Another scripture, of course, is Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 in the New Testament. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, or let's say it start in verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. People have selfish ambition. They want to be important. They want their own way. If they don't get their own way, they get their feelings hurt. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Here's the big lesson. Try to have the mind of Christ in this respect. And he spells it out. Who being in the form of God, he, had, he was plenty important. He had the highest office in the universe except for the Father. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself. He gave that up and came here to die on the cross for you and me. That was his mind. A total emptying of oneself to give, to help, to serve. So have the mind of Christ. And also, as Jesus did, and certainly as many of you have probably done at times, and I had to do, frankly, out in Hawaii. Near the end of the time out there, I kept thinking I'll be brought back, and I'll be brought back, and every Sunday we would go around the island, and I would look back and think, well, they're back there, and -and so-and-so wants to destroy me. And -and so-and-so got message to me that I was to acknowledge that I'd never been converted. I asked the other man, one of them I trusted, did Mr. Armstrong say this? No, it was this other guy. They were trying to destroy me. And I had to know that God up there was alive and he would take care of it. And he finally did. He finally did and the other guy was kicked clear out and never tried to come back. But I had to wait on God. And I fasted twice a week finally. Got down on my face. And ask God, beg God to intervene and to just help me. And literally, I didn't even just pray like this. I'd sometimes get down on my face and say, only you can take care of me. I'm out here and they're back there. They're trying to destroy me. Please help me. And God did help me once I began praying that fervently the last few weeks. But as Jesus was ending his life there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22, verse 39, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. His disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, remove this cup from me. Please don't let me go through this horrible, slow, agonizing death on the cross. One of the most slow, tremendous deaths agonizing deaths, drawn out, painful deaths ever invented. If there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Christ, no doubt, threw himself right on the ground. He came and fell down, and he prayed with all of his heart. And then an angel came strengthening him from heaven. And being in an agony, verse 44, he prayed more earnestly, And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Apparently the blood vessels burst and the sweat congealed with the blood. So his blood, his sweat came out blood red. That's where the saying sweat blood came from, no doubt. Where Christ did this on behalf of you and me. He sweat blood. And when he rose up from prayer and came to his disciples, were they all stirred up? No, they were weak. They weren't even converted yet. And they were sleeping. And he said... Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you fall and enter into temptation. So, brethren, rise and pray, and pray to God with all your heart. And when these things come on you, I'm mad, I'm bitter, I want my own thing. I'm going to leave the true church of God, even though I know in my heart the work's being done, the full truth is being preached, the government of God is being administered, but I don't think it's quite perfect with me, but I'm all mad, and this minister I don't like, or that elder corrected me, or this, this other lady got to buy the coffee pot, or whatever it was. You know, you get all your, all your feelings hurt. Don't do that. Pray fervently, lest you enter into temptation, and fight to stay in the church of God, the true church where the work is being done. Because, brethren, 
leaving the true church of God is not worth it. It is just not worth it. You would be forfeiting a much higher reward in the kingdom of God than if you stayed where Christ is working. And if you left and stayed gone and never came back in any way, you'd not even be in God's kingdom at all. Maybe you'd go off and join some other little group or something. Maybe you'd be in the kingdom, but Christ could never trust you the same way if you left for some of the reasons I've described, which are overwhelming, the ones reason people leave for. Think about it. Put first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek God's kingdom with all your heart and pray with all your heart, lest you enter in temptation and any of you would ever think of leaving the true church of God where Christ is doing His own work today at the end of the age.